Okay, so hi everyone, good afternoon. It's great to see such a full room, uh, a bit intimidating, I must say, but I'll do my best. Uh, so I'll be presenting this paper we're working on with Ana de la O and Cecilia Rosell, all political scientists, so go easy on the endogeneity questions, please. Um, <laughs> So um, I guess the motivation for this is what motivates this whole uh, conference, right? Like despite uh, the fact that we've had significant ad advances in the region in several fronts, including political, economic, and social, we, st we still see um, large inequality gaps in, in, in several dimensions. Um, and scholars have been pointing out to a possible fragmentation of uh, the so-called social contract uh, and pointing to this uh, increasing trend of opting out from public services to private services as a possible sort of explanation of this. Um, so in this paper, we're going to focus on education as one of these uh, public services. Um, and as this graph sh shows, uh, Latin America is actually the region with the highest levels of um, private school enrollment rates across the world. Uh, this is also increasing, thus you know, further, furthering uh, the gap with higher income countries. So what we do in this paper, we sort of um, engage with three questions. The first one is sort of where is this happening in the region? Is this uh, uh, happening everywhere in the, in the same levels? Or is there some variation? Uh, and we're going to use household surveys to sort of tap into this question. Then we ask why this is happening. So why are parents choosing to sell, send their children to private schools instead? For this, we mostly rely on uh, very rich existing literature uh, that has many suggestive answers for this. And then finally, we ask, okay, what are the consequences for the social contract, right? And we have simply suggestive, descriptive uh, evidence that uh, using public opinion services um, on this. So throughout the paper, we uh, engage with three main arguments. The first one is this idea by Albert Hirschman uh, of this distinction between exiting uh, or using your voice um, instead. So the idea of exit is, you know, parents are probably dissatisfied with the quality of public schooling, so they decide to, those that can afford it, of course, decide to move to public services instead. Instead of using their voice, so remaining in the public system and demanding for uh, changes and improvements in the quality of the schooling. Now, this is especially problematic if those that are leaving public services are those that not only have more uh, economic power, but political power as well, right? So what happens then is that those that are remaining in the public system are children not only of lower income, receiving, um, in theory, lower quality schooling, but whose parents also have less resources to voice you know, their demands and, and, and again, demand for improvements in the quality of schooling. Um, the second is also this idea of this, this fiscal trap that uh, Leopoldo Ferguson explained very much nicely uh, yesterday in, in, in a talk where you know, if also people are leaving the system, they're not using public schooling anymore, so they may be, may be less predisposed to continue collaborating or in this case paying taxes to finance these services. They're not, they're not using them anymore, so you know, why do I still need to pay for things I don't use? Um, and then finally, we also engage with a theory of social affinity or contact theory that has been referenced uh, a lot throughout the, the conference, actually, is just this broad idea that um, having interaction with out groups or people that are different from you, either you know, religious, nationality, social economic groups, um, having greater interaction can lead to many positive effects, you know, less prejudice, uh, more empathy, uh, and eventually a higher predisposition to collaborate for you know, increasing the welfare of those groups as well. So for the first uh, question on where is this happening in the region, again, we're gonna use um, households, harmonized house, household service provided uh, by the IDB for seven countries, um, roughly in the 2000, 2018 period. So what we he see here is just, you know, we're just plotting the trends of private school enrollment uh, for school-aged children across these seven countries. Although there is a generalized, uh, you know, upward trend, the levels are not the same throughout all countries, right? So in the case of uh, Mexico, for instance, it's clearly flat. So in Mexico, there doesn't seem to have been this, you know, opting out uh, uh, trend. The case of Peru is the most evident one uh, where there's uh, a, a very sort of pronounced uh, increased trend in private school enrollment in the last 20 years. Um, 
And then countries sort of uh, in the middle where there has been increase but not as pronounced. And then there's also differences in levels, right? So Argentina is the country among these that has the highest levels of private school enrollment, around 30%, and Peru has reached those uh, levels recently. But this also speaks to the difference in offers of private schooling, right? So in Argentina, for instance, a, a large majority of, of kids that attend private schools are attending subsidized religious schools, so which makes tuition fees much more uh, modest and accessible by lower income households. And in Peru, there has been an increase in the low fee uh, private schools, which I mean, the, the name perfectly describes what these are, schools that are again lower fees, accessible for low income households, but then they, they may not be providing this sort of improvement in the quality um, of education necessarily, but we still see households deciding to move out of the public system nonetheless. So in terms of sort of what are some correlates or determinants or wh which are those households that are opting out, uh, income is obviously the, the most intuitive one um, that we look at first. And again, although there's always a, a positive association with income, the level at which income starts mattering varies across countries, right? So in Argentina, again, we see children from households in the first, say, even the second decile have, comparatively speaking, high rates of private school enrollment, right? Whereas in Mexico, this sort of increase in private school enrollment doesn't begin um, up until like uh, income that's all eight or nine, right? That's when we see the jump. Before that, it doesn't really happen, right? And again, other countries in the middle, where it's more in the income that's all five or six, where we actually start seeing this increase. And again, the case of Peru here, the, the, the blue line is 2018, the red line is uh, 2002. We see also there, there have been some changes over time. Peru, again, the most obvious one where um, income plays a much more uh, important role nowadays than it did almost 20 years ago. We also explore some other correlates, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to show them, obviously. Um, the level of education of the head of the household matters and the direction we'd expect. Things like occupational categories, urban-rural, and this is mostly an urban phenomenon. Um, formality also matters, even keeping constant these, these other variables. Uh, when the head of household is a formal worker, we also see higher rates of private school enrollment. Now on the second question on why this is happening, um, again, turning to the literature, there are basically two big arguments about this. Perhaps the first one that comes to mind is that uh, this idea that public schools have worse quality of education, less access to resources or technology or to better salaries for teachers, etc. And the second one, uh, and here the work of Leopoldo Ferguson and collaborators and Maria Jose Alvarez, uh, who, which they presented yesterday for, for the case of Colombia, is a great illustration uh, of this non-instructional dimension, right? So parents are deciding to move to private schools because they have access to social networks, social ha capital, or some more you know, non-tangible like status symbols that they can access through private schooling. So again, the work of uh, Leopoldo Ferguson, much recommended. His book is on sale in the first floor, so we can talk about commission later. Um, and then perhaps a, a third thing that could fit on, on, on either of these is the fact that private schools sometimes offer just longer school days. So instead of a four-hour day, it's an eight-hour day, or even more days of school throughout the years, right, when they're in countries that have you know, strikes for public teachers, private schools don't have this issue, and that may also be a reason driving these um, changes. Now, in sort of to tap a little bit into the second idea of non-instructional uh, dimension, we, we obviously don't have much data on this, but with our household surveys, what we did is constructed this segregation index, the Duncan segregation index, well, much used in, in the literature. And basically what we're measuring is what is the proportion of poor students that would have to move from public to private schools so that the proportion of this population is homogeneous across these two types of schools, right? So the closer to one this measure is, the more segregated the system is. So the more the poor are in public and the non-poor are in, in private. So we construct this for subnational units in each country, so department or state, that's the lowest we could go. Ideally, we'd have this at, say, the neighborhood level, but the data only uh, allows us to do this. Um, so here we're plotting on the x-axis, the segregation index for 2014 and the private school enrollment for 2018. Obviously, there's a, a, an association between these two because private school enrollment rates go into the measure of the index. So there's obviously a mechanic association which we'd expect them to be related. But by lagging segregation for, for a few years, we, we, we sort of tried to break that relationship up a little bit. 
And again, as we'd expect, then what we see is in context of higher segregation, we also see higher rates of private school enrollment. And then we, we, we regress, um, we have a regression where we're predicting private school enrollment rates and we interact um, income with these segregation rates. And even though in general, again, we see this um, positive trend. So in context of greater uh, segregation, the role of income is more pronounced for that decision to uh, leave public schools. Or in other words, where uh, there's low segregation or where there's a better mix of poor and non-poor students in, in schools, then income is not such an important uh, sort of de determinant of this decision of where you're sending your, school, your kid. Okay, and then finally with this last question of um, does this matter for the, the social contract? So for this, um, we're turning to public opinion data, uh, Latino Arometro 2011 and LaPop 2016. Both surveys include a question of whether the respondents attended private school back in the day. So we're going to be looking at adults, comparing adults that attended private versus public schools um, when they were younger, not at parents who decide to send their children to private or public schools. Uh, now, of course, there's huge problems, endogeneity uh, problems here, and uh, we, we, we can't really make any causal claims, uh, simply descriptive with this observational data we have. But we hope that at least by the fact that this is, so the treatment happened a long time ago, it was not sort of in the, the control of these adults, right? It's a decision that was made for them when they were younger by their parents. Um, so yeah, there, there's that. Um, so what we see then is, first what we uh, compare is opinions about the quality of public education um, in these two groups. Again, adults that attended public or private schools when they were younger. And what we see is, sort of a, a, a negative association here. So those that attended private schools tend to have worse um, uh, evaluations of public uh, school systems, just that the quality in general is, is worse and that teachers in, in the public system don't have the, the, the tools or the knowledge to teach kids appropriately. Um, and then sort of in line with this idea of, of the fiscal trap, sort of that, oh, people that aren't using these systems may be less predisposed to, to collaborate we only have one question that is somewhat suggestive of this. So they ask people whether they think sort of in a spectrum of who is responsible for paying for public schools, either the state or the family. And we see that those adults that attended private school tend to uh, say that the family is more responsible for this. So perhaps some su suggestion that this shouldn't be paid with public funds that we're all contributing to. And then finally, uh, I think perhaps most interesting, with, in line with this uh, contact theory, uh, the bulk of this literature is mostly, say, about uh, race or in non-school settings. There's little uh, that talks about interaction with other social economic groups in a school setting. But there's at least two very important uh, papers here. Uh, one from Londoño Vélez uh, this year was actually uh, evaluating uh, a program here from uh, from Colombia called Ser Pilo Paga, which basically the state would give scholarships to low-income students to attend universities like, like this one uh, where we're in now. And she does find that actually uh, higher-income students, when they have this increased interaction with low-income students, their predisposition to collaborate uh, with redistribution and support redistribution increases. Uh, sort of their ideas about income distributions also uh, improve. And then another paper from India, which is actually for school-aged children, again a similar initiative where lower income students are introduced to um, sort of high income or elite schools. And we see that these students, as they belong to these more mixed uh, social economic groups, increase their pro-social behavior, altruistic behavior right there. For instance, more willing to uh, stay after school, to raise money for, for poor uh, uh, kids and things like that. Um, so, what we could do is we just simply, uh, uh, again, regressed uh, private school with these two classic questions on support for redistribution. So the most important one is this question on, do you think the state should implement uh, strong policies to reduce inequality? This data actually comes from La Pop, and we only have three, three countries that, that included this question. So it would be nice to uh, have this in, in the future. Um, so, so again, just Chile, Ecuador, and in, in, in Uruguay, but we see again those that attended private schools um, tend to have lower support um, of, of redis state redistributive efforts. 
So uh, finally, just to wrap up, so basically what we try to do in this paper is simply give sort of a, uh, an idea of where this opting out is happening in, in, in public schooling, um, why this may be the case, and again, some suggestions of, of what are the consequences for uh, redistributive behaviors. Um, we are extending this to health as well. So, and I mean, our, our very basic preliminary evidence, uh, at least in, the, in this last aspect, suggests that the effects are not as strong. This is, I mean, this, this makes sense, right? Your interaction with the health system is much less frequent and intense uh, than, than your interaction with the school system. And also, as we've learned uh, throughout the, this conference, your, your experiences in those formative years uh, can have huge consequences in the future, including for uh, political attitudes. But nonetheless, interesting to, to compare um, how opting out from different services uh, works. Uh, yes, that's all. Thank you very much.